The topic of our discussion today is beams of friction. There are some equations, but before that, I want to kind of zoom out and see why do we care about the beam deflection and why we are interested in determining the deformation in beams. We have already talked about how to design beams for safety, how to design them to make sure that stress is not exceeding the allowable stress. Is it the only factor that is important if you are designing a building? Look at this classroom. This is a kind of big classroom and there are some beams that are running on the roof to take the loads from the second floor. Consider this case. There are some excited students upstairs celebrating something. They're jumping up and down. Hopefully, the floor is designed in a way that it can take the loads. But is this the only factor that they need to consider for designing that? What about the beam deflections? Have you ever been to any building that by even walking on the floor, you see that the floor is shaking? Does it make you feel comfortable? Probably not. You know that the building is safe. It never broke before and hopefully it's not going to break in future. But failure is not the only factor that we need to consider for designing our building. Deformation also matters. Let me give you another example. Consider a very high-rise building. You are sure that the building was designed in a proper way, but that top floor is going to shake even in small wind, and no one wanted to go to that and have an office or house on top of that floor. It's just a feeling of the safety. So we need to know what are the deformations caused by the forces in order to make sure that the deformation is not exceeding the maximum value. So beam deflection matters in certain cases in order to make sure that the safety or the serviceability of structure is in a proper way. Consider a very general case of beam deflections. A beam is subjected to different types of loading, and we want to determine how much is the deformation in this beam. First of all, in the shear and moment diagrams, we have learned that the loading and shear diagrams are related together. The shear diagram is the area under the loading. Mathematically, I can describe that as shear force as integral of loading. Similar to that, moment diagram is built by determining the area under the shear diagram. Mathematically, we can describe that the moment is integral of the shear force. If we integrate it one more time, we get slope of the beam after considering the modulus of elasticity and the moment of inertia of the beam. E, modulus of elasticity, multiplied by the moment of inertia, is a constant number. Multiplied by slope of the beam would be equal to integral of the moment diagram. If we integrate it one more time, we get the deformation in the beam. Deformation is shown by delta and that would be integral of slope of the beam. So this is the way that we can build the deformation equations in any beam with arbitrary loading. Deformation, which is shown in orange here, shows the deflection of the beam from the original point after loading. And slope of the beam shows the slope of that neutral axis, which is shown by dashed orange line with respect to the horizontal. The slope of the beam is simply derivative of beam's deflection. Now considering this general equation, I want to solve the problem. A cantilever beam subjected to a distributed load and a concentrated bit moment at the right end. And I wanted to solve this problem for determining how much is the deformation in this beam. In order to solve this problem, I'm going to split that into two different beams. The first beam would be the beam that is subjected to the distributed load, and the second beam is the beam that is subjected to a moment. So if we add up these two beams, we would get the original beam. Now I'm going to determine how much is the deformation in the first beam. Loading in this case is constant, and I'm going to use negative here because that distributed load is going to be downward. Now we can build the shear diagram. We are integrating a constant number and the resultant would be negative wx plus a constant, I'm going to call that c1. In order to determine c1, we need to use some boundary conditions. Is there any part of this beam that I know what is the shear force in that point? Looking at this cantilever beam, we know that shear force at the right end should be equal to zero because there is no concentrated force and that's a free end. So I'm going to apply that condition. I would say that at x equal to L, shear force is going to be 0. We would get negative WL plus C1 as equal to 0. So C1 would be WL. Okay? That would be the constant number 
that we have for the first integral. Now I'm going to integrate it one more time to build the moment diagram. The shear diagram is negative wx plus wl and I'm going to integrate that with respect to x. So we would have negative wx squared over 2 plus wlx plus another constant number that I'm going to call that c2. Again, similar to the previous concepts, we need to determine that constant by using a boundary condition. So we know that the moment at the right end has to be zero. So at x equal to L, we know that the moment is going to be zero. Now let's plug the numbers into that equation. So we have determined the moment diagram for this case. All right, I'm going to integrate it one more time in order to determine slope of the spin. Ei theta x would be integral of the moment diagram. And there will be another constant number here that I'm going to call that C3. How can I determine C3 in this case? In order to determine that, we need to know how the beam is going to deform. Because of that distributed load, we will see this kind of deformation. We see that the deformation at the left end is equal to zero. Also, because that is fixed, that beam is going to have zero slope at the beginning. So slope of the beam at that point is going to be zero. So at x equal to zero, we know that slope of the beam is going to be zero. And if I plug the numbers in, we conclude that C3 is going to be equal to zero. I'm going to integrate it one more time. All right, similar to the previous case, we know that the formation at the left end is going to be zero. Now plugging that back into this equation, we would conclude that C4 is going to be zero. So that's it. We have built the deformation equation in this problem. Let me simplify that over here. Factor out wx squared out of that equation with a negative sign. And let's take out 24 on the denominator. We would have the first term x squared, the second term negative 4lx, and the last term 6l squared. So this is the equation that I determined for deformation of a cantilever beam subjected to distributed load. Okay, we have solved just half of the problem. We have determined what is the deformation because of the distributed load. We need to do the same for the other one. So for that case, we have the beam number two, which is the beam subjected to a moment at the right end. So loading in this case is zero. I'm gonna say W is equal to zero. What about the shear force in this problem? What is the shear force at the right end? Zero. Is there any other force in between? No. So shear force is going to be also zero. We will see that the moment would be integral of a zero value, so that has to be constant number. And how can I determine that constant number here? Moment at the right end should be m. That means that c1 is equal to m. Okay. Theta x would be integral of the moment, integral of m dx and we would have another constant that I'm going to call this c2. We know that slope of this beam at the beginning is zero and that means that that constant number is going to be equal to zero. Ei deformation would be integral of slope of the beam. So we have derived this equation delta x is mx squared divided by 2ei. There is a negative sign here and that's because of the direction of the moment that we are acting on that beam. All right, so we have determined how much is the deformation in this beam. Now I need to add up these two equations together and determine where is the maximum deformation in this case. Let me ask you this question. If I have a function, how can I determine the maximum value of that? Yes. So take the derivative of the equation, a function, and set that equal to zero, and then solve it for x, right? And after solving that for x, plug that back into the equation, and that would give us the maximum value. By the way, it is not always giving us the maximum. It is either maximum or minimum of function. But in this case, that would always give us the maximum. 
So I can derive this equation with respect, respect to x and determine where is the location of that. We would see that the maximum deformation would be at the right end and then plug that back into this equation and then solve it for x. Is it an easy way to solve a problem using integration? It's totally up to you if you want to go and use the integration method in the exam. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that because just one problem would take probably more than half of the time that we have for the exam. So how do we solve these types of problems? We are lucky because there are some people who have done this calculation for us and put that in the table. We just need to go and use the tables for determining the deformations. But this is not as easy as this like. Why? Because we have limited number of cases that we have the deformation equations for. And those limited numbers of cases are not capable to satisfy all the possible situations that we have in the beam's reflection. We need to somehow mix those equations in order to solve more complicated cases. 